Greetings, esteemed viewers. It's been a while, and this one will be a long one. Today, I'll be having a look at what should rightly be called the darker side of female nature, and more specifically, the darker side of female sexual psychology with regards to mate selection preference. In addition, I will be talking extensively about the concept of the protector and provider, and will argue that at least in a modern context, the protector and provider are rarely interchangeable, although we often hear the terms used as if they were synonymous with each other. On the other hand, I will also argue that in prehistoric times, the man who embodied the sought-after protector and provider role was, in fact, one and the same. And this has led to a powerful and disastrous dichotomy in the modern female's mate selection preferences. In prehistoric times, without the advancements of a complex economy and technology, the protector and provider were two sides of the same coin. He was the alpha male brute, if you will. In his role as a provider, he was an efficient hunter, likely skilled in constructing shelter, and possessed great physical prowess and stature. In short, he was able to provide food and shelter to his female mates, thus optimizing the survival chance of his offspring. In the same token, the role of protector, and here protector was and is simply code for a man of violence, more specifically a man willing to inflict violence upon the external world, and still more specifically, a man who is willing to f inflict violence upon the external world in the defense of the female. I'm going to repeat this. A protector in the eyes of a female was, and is, a man who is willing to inflict violence upon others on her behalf to ensure the survival of her offspring and the survival of said female. He is, in essence, the perfect proxy agent for violence, and he will wield violence in her name both to protect her interests and his perceived interests inasmuch as he is very willing to commit violence against interloper men whom he sees as a, th as a threat, as well as men whom his female mate sees as a, th as a threat. Have you ever asked yourself what the allure of a man in uniform is for a female? A man in uniform is not necessarily rich, but he is a man who, by the very definition of his trade, is committed to inflicting violence upon the world. With the coming of civilization, a trade and barter system, as well as modernizing technology, the protector-provider role began to dissolve itself of its synonymous qualities. With an economy and currency, as well as modern conveniences, physical prowess and violence became less and less of a factor concerning, concerning provision. This allowed many so-called beta males to compete for female attention in the mating game because of their ability to provide for the female in economic terms. However, this provision, it must be noted, is not the same thing as protection, and is not viewed as such by the female. And because the protector and provider role was one and the same for most of our history as a species, the coming of modernity has allowed for somewhat paradoxical instincts in the modern female, although her sexual urges remain much the same. The typical modern male provider is not violent by, na by his nature. He is a worker, and he offers his labor and money in exchange for access to female sex and reproduction. This is, of course, prostitution, since virtually every relationship based solely on provision is simply an exchange of resources, money for sex. Women even appear to be some, somewhat hardwired for this sort of relationship on, of prostitution on some basic level, as evidenced by female simians of the lower orders of primates engaging in prostitution in exchange for resources as soon as some trade and barter system is established or service can be rendered in exchange for sex. Suffice to say, the provider-male-female relationship is always mercantile in nature and based on exchange of goods or services and lacks any other foundation. Some observations on monkeys. In 2005, a Yale behavioral economist with an interest in evolution and anthropology conducted experiments with capuchin monkeys wherein he introduced a trade and barter system to the monkeys, who then grew to understand and make use of it. During this experiment, female monkeys were observed to engage in sex after being paid a token by the male monkey. Upon receiving the token and copulating, the female monkey immediately traded in for a grape. Does this sound familiar? In addition, sex for service has also been observed in other lower primate species. Quote, according to the paper Payment for Sex in the Macaque Mating Market, published in the December issue of Animal Behavior, males in a group of about 50 long-tailed macaques in Kalimantan, Tenga, Indonesia, traded grooming services for sex and females. Researchers who studied the monkeys for some 20 months found that males offered their payment up front 
as a kind of free sex ritual. It worked. After the females were groomed by the male partners, female sexual activity more than doubled, from an average of 1.5 times an hour to 3.5 times. The study also showed that the number of minutes that males spent grooming hinged on the number of females available at the time. The better a male's odds of getting lucky, the less nitpicking time the females received. Though primates have been observed trading grooming for sh food sharing or infant care, this is the first time this kind of exchange has been observed between male and female primates in a sexual context, says le le lead researcher Michael Goomert of Singapore's Nanyang Technological University. Demonstrating that the amount of time a male macaque will invest in his partner depends largely on how many options it has around. We, more evolved primates, may be tempted to take a cynical view of these findings, but the study's author suggests a more favorable interpretation. The macaque's exchange of services simply in illustrates a nifty system of cooperation that allows for successful mating. The basic premise, says Gumert, is called biological market theory which follows the elementary principles of supply versus demand. When applied to the voluntary sex life of a long-tailed macaque, it means that the price that one group is willing to pay for a commodity the other group has depends on the scarcity or abundance of that commodity on the market." End quote. Therefore, it is safe to say that the act of prostitution is not only confined to humans but can be found in other primates as well, and seems to have some sort of innateness to it inasmuch as it occurs rather readily in nature. I will argue here that as soon as some form of trade and barter system became predominant among humans, prostitution soon accompanied it, with males paying females, either with currency or some other service for sex, and that the exchange of services had very little to do with the attraction felt by said females to the males that did it. It was pure business and profit. Sex was, and always has been, just a commodity on the market, nothing more and nothing less. The only distinction between so-called working girls that society looks down upon and marriage is of duration and honesty. The acknowledged working girl has integrity in what she does, the wife in sheep's clothing does not. My argument here is simple, namely that so-called beta provisor, providers do not arouse female sexual interest, and to the extent that sex is on offer, it is on offer in the form of a pure business transaction. The corollaries of Brifo's law have been much discussed, and I will mention them yet again and go into further depth in discussing them now. Let us recall Brifo's law. The female, not the male, determines all the conditions of the animal family. Where the female can derive no benefit from association with the male, no such association takes place. And here are the corollaries. 1. Past benefit provided by the male does not provide for continued or future association. 2. Any agreement where the male provider provides a current benefit in return for a promise of future association is null and void as soon as the male has provided the benefit. And 3. A promise of future benefit has limited influence on current future association with the influence inversely proportional to the length of time until the benefit will be given and directly proportional to the degree to which the female trusts the male. Now it seems to me that the corollaries of Brifo's law are principally applicable to the provider-prostitute relationship. It is effectively no different from any other contract. When company A provides a service for payment to company B and the contract has been fulfilled and finished, the particular service around which that contract centered is no longer operative after completion of said contract. The problem and issue of the provider-prostitute relationship is that the terms of service are not explicitly stated and are often couched in fairy tale esque language such as, such as romance and love. And furthermore, only the female possesses awareness, and quite vague, I might add, of those terms, so her service, sex, can come to an abrupt halt unbeknownst to her male provider business partner, who likely does not see the relationship in such purely transactional terms, at least on a conscious level, which of course is belied by the fact that he keeps up with the 70-hour work week because he knows the consequences if he fails. The contract is further distorted by the family divorce court system, wherein the male is deprived of the benefits of his labor upon the perceived completion of the contract in the eyes of the female, yet he must continue paying for services no longer rendered. So there is a double distortion, which I will repeat here. One, only the female is aware of the terms of service and the contractual terms, and the contract can be terminated by her at any moment on a whim if she so desires. And two, 
The state aids the female in further contractual obfuscation by forcing the male partner to pay for services that are no longer in effect and on terms he was not even aware of in the first place. Thus the real issue at hand is the obfuscation and deception inherent in the provider-prostitute relationship. Only one party member understands intuitively what's going on and the other party member is left in the dark for the most part, with very le real legal co consequences for his benighted state of mind. Let us now return to the original alpha male brute. I will argue that it is only this type of male that actually arouses female sexual desire, and is also the primary object of desire for DNA propagation. You often see this with cuckolding. The married provider provides for the cuckold of the children of the, al of the wife, and the alpha male brute lends her his genetic material. Moreover, you may ask why I am so convinced that this alpha male brute has the power to wrench away any illusion of loyalty a female might have to her male pr provider. Well, this can be seen in the dalliances that both French and Norwegian women had with Nazi soldiers during World War II, often abandoning their spouses in the process. In particular, we can see that during during the Nazi occupation, not a small number of children were conceived by French women paired up with Nazi soldiers. Quote, Despite more than two million Frenchmen being held in prisoner of war camps, the birth rate boomed in 1942 with an estimated 200,000 children born to Franco-German couples. Up to 30% of births were illegitimate in parts of Paris. That is an impressive number and illustrates well the innate female drive and lust for the alpha male brute symbolized here by the conquering Nazi forces. It is this sort of man that sparks a reprodu reproductive drive. The provider is merely a means to an end. The alpha male brute is that end. That is not to say that women do not mate with provider types. They do. But if a choice exists between one or the other with regards to progeny, the alpha brute will certainly be favored. It is interesting, as an aside, that after the war was over, in both France and Norway, where women had, had extensive da extended dalliances with Nazi soldiers and officers, that their punishment was, uh, more commonly, was most commonly to have their hair shorn off in public. I needn't remind you what happened to male turncoats. Execution, of course. In addition, it is important to be reminded that the quote-unquote war brides of the era had not been nefariously tricked into doing what they did by feminism. There was no feminism of the sort we know today. They were women, acting as women do. Nothing more, nothing less. They saw an opportunity to gain the status. They took that opportunity, despite its moral implications. No one forced them. This point cannot be made often enough, and I will continue to relentlessly drive it home until I am dead if need be. You do not cure a disease by only focusing on the symptoms, and feminism is indeed a symptom of something far greater, namely certain negative congenital features of the human female, predating any political ideology. And here I would like to digress somewhat and address this issue, and it is the issue of female weakness not being equated with male weakness. You'll hear no argument from me against the idea that both men and women are flawed, albeit in different, wa albeit in different ways. What raises my ire, and it should yours, is that female weakness almost universally receives a free pass. If wartime traitors who were male were almost without exception put to death, why were women punished, and I use the term loosely, with the laughably lenient act of having their hair shorn off? Make no mistake, what happened in France and Norway were indeed acts of hypergamy, and yet we have seen hypergamy, understood to be a uniquely female behavioral deficiency, played down and even ignored, with some likening it to taking a crap in the front of the yard, and as here I would like to address the naysayers concerning the matter. There seem to be two types of deflection when it comes to hypergamy, both stemming primarily from men. The first is the more common, and it is simply a redefining of the word. Here, hypergamy is simply a, a woman wanting, quote, a better life for herself, end quote, and wanting to be happy. No different to a man wishing for himself a better life and the pursuit of happiness. It becomes so watered down when treated this way that it ceases to exist for all practical purposes. The other, less common deflection is that hypergamy is akin to feminist patriarchy theory and thus belongs to the realm of the chimerical. And neither deflections have any basis in reality. And I'm about to demonstrate this, and my contention here is simply that hypergamy is real and unique to the human female. As some of you may know the Dalrock blog, to which I will provide a link. 
that includes invaluable data and statistics regarding just such, such issues as these. His blog post on the apex fallacy with respect to marriage and divorce will illustrate that hypergamy is uniquely female. But let us first discuss the apex fallacy. It is most commonly made with regards to men, allegedly being on top of society. Quote, if you take such statements by women, such as uh, men run the world, that is true for them because they only can see men, because they only, because only men they can see are the ones who run the world. Statements like most CEOs are men are true, both in fact and in perception. The reasons this is so are beyond the scope of this particular essay. However, the implication of the converse, that most men are CEOs, is obviously not true to men. It does seem to be true for a lot of women, because most of the men that they can see are CEOs. While women are looking upward and only see CEOs, the men at their level and below see a lot of nose hair." End quote. Meaning that women will only see that which is above them. In the case of a divorce or separation, say a high-profile separation, such as Ashton Kutcher leaving his much older partner to me more for the sake of younger, more attractive women, women will apply the apex fallacy to this generalizing the actions of one man of prominence to be the actions of all men across all spectrums. However, the data and statistics do not show this. As you can see in the chart, the trend of divorce correlates almost to a T with female peak sexual marketplace value and declines after that point in time has been reached. Dalrock also has data where this trend has been tracked across several decades in the UK, seen here once again. The data bears it out with the yellow and green adhering to the trend without exception. There is the issue of the much lower 20 and younger divorce rates. Rather than ignoring it, I will propose my own theory as to why that is the case. And most young females of this age, being at, abs at the absolute peak of their s sexual marketplace value, do not give much thought to the inexorable decline of that value, whereas women in their mid to late 20s become increasingly aware of the inevitable and are thus forced into action, i.e. divorce at a predictable rate. The general trend is the same in the U.S., as can be seen in this chart. Finally, some thoughts by Dalrock himself. Quote, taken together, this data soundly disproves the apex fallacy regarding divorce. The common belief that divorce rates are driven by men discarding older wives for a younger model simply doesn't fit with the data. This is reinforced when you consider that the A AARP found that 66% of the divorces in middle age were initiated by women. This fits with the historical trends of women of all ages initiating divorce, as shown in page three of this paper. Even in middle age, women are still the ones driving divorce rates. The myth of the unloyal husband dumping his hapless wife upon once he feels it is his to his advantage to do so is generally just that, a myth. This won't stop women from pointing, o pointing over and over again to the rare cases they know of in the media or in person where this has occurred. But in the scheme of things, this is clearly an outlier. Across age ranges, divorce is being driven by women, and the likelihood of a couple divorcing in any given year tracks very strongly with whether the wife feels it would be to her advantage not to keep her promise." End quote. So much for the absurd idea that men are hypergamous, or that hypergamy is simply wanting a better life for yourself, to be equated with any other path leading to such a better life. As far as hypergamy being the same as laughable patriarchy theory, the numbers do not lie. We can track female hypergamy via divorce correlated with age group. The same cannot be said for patriarchy theory, which has no data whatsoever, just the chimeras of the fanciful. So, let us take all this into account now. The natural and uniquely female attribute of hypergamy, her preference for domineering brutish men in her mate selection, and the modern state, which in a way is the ultimate alpha male brute, using coercive force to extract wealth from men primarily providers, fulfilling virtually every wish of the female. All of these circumstances render the possibility of a functional, let alone healthy relationship or marriage, a nigh impossibility. There is the natural preference of the female to choose the alpha male brute, at the same time relying on a provider male for raising the offspring. Nevertheless, when the ultimate provider comes along, the state, coupled with the qualities of an alpha male brute, no single man, either provider or brute, can compete. This is the dilemma of the modern man, who is doubly afflicted by the burdens uh, nature set upon him, but also by those burdens of the state, itself ultimately derivative of nature, being essentially socialized natural urges and, ten and tendencies in the form of a superstructure. 
Yet when viewing this colossus of the impossible, most men would rather shut their eyes and dive off the cliff. I find a need to address this, because this feel-good-itis, as I have termed it, is very dangerous to men on the whole. What exactly do I mean by feel-good-itis? Quite simply, the willingness to cast aside all evidence in an effort to feel good or retain some form of vague hope. I can put it in simple terms. Imagine you are a shrewd businessman, and you are about to embark on a business venture. Before doing so, you do a risk assessment. You find out that the business deal has a 95% chance of generating massive losses to you after a three-year period, possibly losing quadruple what you originally invested. Would you invest your money in the deal? Likely not. But most men do not act as shrewd businessmen do when it comes to women. Rather, they are much more akin to gambling and lottery addicts. Imagine if a certain lottery game offered a 1 in 50 million chance of winning. Those are bad odds. And the thing that the typical man does not understand is that each time he plays, his chances stay at 1 in 50 million, because he does not grasp that, the, that repetition and frequency do not increase his odds. He buys ticket after ticket in the vain hope that something will crystallize. And looking at these examples, both that of the shrewd businessman and the lottery addict, is there any area, and I do mean any area, where human beings take upon themselves such astronomically poor odds I can think of none. But like a broken wind-up doll, your average man continues to turn the levers of the casino slot machine as if oblivious. Cognitive, dis cognitive dissonance would be an understatement. If I further extend the analogy, women are the slot machines in the casino, and the state is the casino itself. Both forces are arrayed against the man. Hope and change, do you remember that slogan, that one? The one used by Obama, well, Hope is the last vestige of a fairy tale you, that you once believed. You know it to be false. Why persist in the charade? I ask this simply because, unfortunately, too many men saddled with too much hope end up a corpse on the floor by their own hand. And that is all I have to say on that particular subject. It is important to note that I am not simply pointing out female flaws for the sake of pointing out female flaws. That accomplishes nothing. As the tried and hackneyed saying goes, we only learn from our mistakes. And when the entire subset of the populi population is not allowed to fail, the same subset cannot improve. Imagine learning an instrument, and the teacher lies and tells you from day one that all is well and you're doing remarkably w uh, well in learning that instrument. Then comes the concert. This, of course, is a recipe for disaster. Whereas men are only allowed to fail, women are only allowed not to fail. No good can come of this and it must be relentlessly pointed out until it has been corrected. One hindrance, of course, is women's greater receptivity towards feelings of shame, and this does not mesh well with learning by failure, as their egos prevent them from accepting that they too, just as men, are flawed by nature, albeit in different ways. With only men having their flaws pointed out to them, and only men having to deal with the consequences of their failures and those flaws. And where does that leave us men at the end of the day? it leaves us with a clear picture of just what reality is. No more fairy tales, no more vague hope, just the way it is. And that ideally should be liberating, because once you realize the nature of the beast and internalize it, you are no longer beholden to that beast, nor do you need to fear it. By avoiding the doubly entangling alliance with both women and her alpha male brute, the state, you are free to do what you as an individual wishes to do, whatever that might be. Going your own way, at its heart, simply means removing the shackles that you had allowed to be placed upon you and doing your own thing. Freedom is the choice you can make, and is the highest commodity on offer. No female in the entire world can give you that freedom, for the illusion of security you've been fed is just that, an illusion. And when you follow the dictum of just shutting up and getting in the line, you will experience the disillusion of that illusion, and it will not be pleasant. Freedom is something you can choose, that you can have, and is the only worth having in the current state thing worth having in the current state of affairs. Thanks for watching. I look forward to your comments and views. Everyone take care.